So I have to tell you guys about the very first time um, my wife and I were married, and it was the first Christmas we had, right? So this, this is what it was. And so we got married, and we're going to have first Christmas. And I was with my boss one day, and he goes, hey, he goes, you're a newlywed. What are you getting your wife for Christmas? And I said, well, a, a vacuum cleaner. And, and he just looks at me he's like, dude, are you stupid? And I'm like, well, maybe, but, but she asked for a vacuum cleaner. And he goes like, Mark, you, you need to understand, you don't buy your wife a vacuum cleaner, especially when she asks for one. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, he's like, imagine her joy on Christmas morning as she's opening up how you have symbolized that she now is going to do all the vacuuming because you gave it to her. It's like, don't buy your wife a vacuum, even if she says so. And that was the first time among many times that I began to realize that when, when your wife says something, it doesn't necessarily mean what the words are. I knew the husbands, have you ever figured that out? <laughs> One day my wife looked at me and she said, yes means no and no means yes. And see, you, some of you guys understand it. Others are sitting here going, what is he talking about? That's okay, don't worry. I bring that up to highlight that men are clueless. That's, that's our first principle today. Men are generally clueless in, in all things. And, and, and yes, see, now we get some amens. That's right. That's what we're talking about. And so when we talk about this idea that they will become one, I mean, it just, it, it just sounds, you're just like, yeah, that's like the old myth, right? That's the creation myth. I'm like, no, it's the creation story. And it's still true, right? And, and we live in this world that has is, is done everything it can to convince us the story isn't true. And I understand why, and I understand all those things, and, and as we've said all through page one and page two, I never want us to throw out science or any of those things. What I want us to do is welcome them all together and actually follow the evidence where it leads. And in this case, we're following a different kind of evidence. We're not talking about the origin of the species. We're talking about the war of the sexes, right? You know, and, and, and how it started and what happens. And here's the thing, guys, and this is so important. If you're single, you're divorced, you're you're broken in your relationship, you're lonely, you're frustrated, you're angry, this message is maybe more for you than any of us here. Because this idea of marriage is what God's plan was all along for all of the universe, right? And the fact that it's broken is one of the key components of our story, the story that we have inherited. Because as Barry's going to share with you guys next week from page three, this whole thing blows up, right? Because Adam and Eve are like, dude, we're going to do things our way. You know, that's a slight paraphrase, but that's what happened. And they didn't trust God. And you and I, we know how that goes. When you don't trust God, you're like, oh, it's like driving the car off the road. I mean, it's just what happens. Take a look at Genesis 2, verses 24 and 25. This was God's promise. It was so interesting because it's, it's quoted by the apostles. It's quoted by Jesus It's quoted by everybody who's telling the story of God in the Bible all throughout. It's one of the most quoted verses in the whole Bible over and over again by itself. And it's Genesis 2, 24 to 25. And it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. They will become one. There's There's this push by God to say, look, let us make our let us make man the human in our image so there's already this sort of unity of community going on within the godhead which we can't even begin to imagine and then he creates man and he creates woman and he goes now you guys have a community of unity and then from that you're going to be blessed and multiply and fill the earth and do all these things and you're going to rule the earth and subdue it you know we saw last week which is so strange because we think of ruling and subduing as this you know, forceful, negative, warring kind of thing when God's plan was always for blessing and for family and for people who never, listen to me, feel alone. So I know there are people in this room who would sit there and talk about their relationships that have failed. I know there are people in this room that haven't had maybe a significant relationship yet, and they're they're just kind of like, I don't know how that's going to work. Allie, I'm I'm picking on Allie, because she always says to me, I'm not getting married, Dad. Because one time she said to me, she goes, why do people wear jewelry? And I'm like, well, sometimes we like to wear jewelry. And she's like, I'm never going to wear jewelry. And I'm like, well, what about a wedding ring? And she goes, never. (laughs) 
I said, does that mean you're never getting married? She said, precisely. And I'm like, okay, now I owe her five bucks. But the point is still the truth. And then she's like, no, I'm never going to. So some of you guys may just be in a position of life where you're like, that ain't never going to happen, right? And I always remind Allie of the story that Debbie, eight months before she met me, said she was never getting married. And we got married eight months after we met. So there you go. You never know what can happen. Don't say never. But this idea that if you feel alone, you need to know that God, that's not the plan. It's never his plan. Never his design. But see, here's the other side of it. The last sentence in this passage, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Before the fall, humans were perfect. They did not have sin. They did not have the brokenness that we all are infected with. They did not have the shame that we all now bear, or at least that we sometimes bear. Sometimes you might be like, Lord, hey, I believe in Jesus. I'm shame-free and I praise God for that. And We're going to talk more about that. But in the meantime, the reality is, is that what we probably go through is this ebb and flow of the, the accuser comes to you and he says you're garbage and he says the reason why your relationships are all messed up is because you're worthless and all of those kinds of things. And what I want you to know is that when they, when they were experiencing perfection and unity with God, they felt no shame. And through Jesus, that gift is going to be offered to you and to me. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. We'll put this on screen and highlight these key words. Because he says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. What do you think that phrase means, the days are evil? You know, this is something I want you to ponder and think about. I want you to, as you're going through your week this week, what, be thinking, you know, like, you know, tomorrow's Monday and a lot of you guys will be getting up and getting ready for work and you're going to be doing your thing. Some of you guys will be going to school. Some of you guys will be, you know, chipping all the ice off the house or whatever. You know, whatever is going to be going on, you're going to be doing your activities, and I want you to be pondering as you're driving, working, getting ready, running the hair dryer. What does it mean that the days are evil? What does it mean that the days are evil? Now, you might immediately think, well, you know, turn on the news, right? There's, there you see all the evil. But I'm going to suggest that this is not about what's going on in cable news. This is what's going on right here in our hearts. This is what's going on as we think about our past. This is what's going on as we experience life and we go to work and the coworkers treat us poorly or our, you know, our ex calls us up and treats us like trash again and we have to be like, oh, I just got done trying to forgive them and now they're doing that again. You know, and all these kinds of things, right? And, and you just go through life and you're like, the days <laughs> are evil. Like, it feels like the universe is against me. I don't know if I'm the only one who ever feels that way, right? I know I'm not. And so this is what we need to remember is that the days are evil. The, the world is broken. And it's not just out there. It's in here. This is our problem. Take a look at Ephesians 5, verses 21 and 22. So then, Paul's response. Uh, you know, just like, high five, Paul. Good job. Are you sure the Holy Spirit was guiding you here? And of course, the answer is yes. But when we read these two verses we're all on some level going to bristle. This is what happens. This goes against our grain. Submit to one another. I mean, you know, I mean, how, how often have you said, like, for people say, hey, do you, do you go to church? Yeah. I just, find, I just find my faith very fulfilling. I love going to church. I, I love this hearing, you, know, you hear about how God's taking care of everything, you know, and, and besides, I love to submit to people. You know, I mean, you see, yeah, yeah. I mean, because that, that's like the message of the Bible is to submit and to be submissive and, to, you know, just to lay down my life instead of standing up or whatever, you know. To, so it's about what we're for, not what we're against, you know, and it's all these kinds of things. And why do we submit to one another? Because of Jesus. Because he submitted for you and for me. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's one of those where it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> don't make this complicated. This is not a highfalutin theological position here receive the word of God and of course what we do then is we get the patriarchal thing going next wives submit to your husbands and you know there have been places in in on the east coast where they have put that verse just by itself wives submit to your husbands on a giant billboard and like see that's what the bible does to society and 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 make no mistake make no mistake for thousands of years people have abused this this passage they take it out of context, but guess what? That's nothing new. It's never going to change. You know, it, it's, it's like, the, it, it's like the, the context where the one guy says to the other guy in the Old Testament, fall on your sword. You know, I'm like, that's, we, don't, we don't live by that either. The point being, you must have the story. 
Why would, why would God want wives to submit to their husbands as to the Lord? Why would they want to do that? Why would He say to everyone, submit to one another? Where is this coming from? Take a look at verse 23. Because we've got to find out how it works. He says, For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, His body, of which He is Savior. The Savior. You know, this would be a really convenient passage for me to not put on the screen today or to highlight for us to study. Because if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because um, if you met my husband, you know he's not the head of nothing, right? You know, or my ex-husband or whatever. I mean, you can, you, we could all go to there. And I would be like, yeah, I don't, I'm not surprised. Just ask Deborah in the Old Testament. She'd be able to tell you about the men who wouldn't do what they needed to do, right, in the book of Judges. But the point is this is not about how people actually do. This is about what God has designed it to be, right? And so the design is very simple. God the Father sends the Son. The Son submits to the Father. Then the man submits to the Son. And the wife submits to the man. And the children submit to the mom. And I mean, it's just to submit, submit, submit. Submit to one another. Submission is the path, guys. This is the part that's so hard. Submission is the path of Jesus. <laughs> he was telling Nicodemus. They were met at midnight because Nicodemus didn't want to be seen with Jesus. So he came to him at night. And he's like, you know, we think, we think you're from God, Jesus, because you're doing like miracles and stuff. That's a slight paraphrase. And Jesus is like, actually, Nicodemus, if, if you want to be of God, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus is like, what does that mean? And he's like, he goes, because a person can't like go back in his mom's womb and... and, and Jesus is like, you claim to be Israel's teacher and you don't understand this. And then he says this, for the Son of Man must be lifted up. And when he's lifted up, he'll be glorified, right? What is Jesus talking about when he says lifted up? Because see, in our world, lifted up means, man, you're going to be on, you're going to be on all the talk shows, you're going to be the glory, you know, you're going to get all the fame. And that's what lifted up means. Not with Jesus. His throne is the cross. It's the cross where he laid his life down for you and for me. And he's telling Nicodemus, it's got to be lifted up. Right? The path of Jesus is submission. It's laying down. And I know, because we got all these things working against us. We're all, we're all Americans. Americans, we don't lay down. It's the home of the brave, right? Get out of my, get out of my face, people. Right? And that's what it is. And I get that. And we're all individualists because we're, we're modernists, right? And we all have like, grown up and saying, you make your own choices. You're free, right? And, and it's like, yeah, but <laughs> Jesus said, I'll tell you what, go with me. He who is last shall be first. And the interesting but see, the problem that we have when we, when we think about this is that we're like, yeah, but, what, but like, how, what does it mean that the husband would be the head of the wife? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question. Take a look of page, excuse me, not page, but verse 25, where he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I have found that any time... You know, because as a pastor, I'll get sometimes invited to come and talk about relationships with people in the midst of one. Maybe they're having challenges or maybe they're just having questions. But the point is, we'll have this conversation. And what I have found is whenever this happens, whenever husbands love their wives, this amazing thing happens, and that is the wives are like, that's awesome, when they love their wives like Jesus did us. That's awesome. It's incredible. And they have no problem participating in the marriage at that point in, dare we say, submitting. Because when a husband loves his wife the way Christ loved the church, and get ready, husbands, I'm really sorry to tell you this, that means you go first. What do we mean go first? I mean, you have conflict. It's all her fault. You say you're sorry first. But I didn't even do anything. Yes, that's exactly right. Actually, you did. You were born. So get, get over it, right? Husbands go first. Well, but like, yeah. For while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. He went first. See, this is, this is where it starts. Husbands go first. You lay your life down for your wife. And in our... <laughs> I have to tell you, so, so I had this on my computer screen because I was kind of going through, getting ready for today. And Debbie comes in the room. 
And she goes, huh, guess that means we're getting chickens after all, huh? And I was like, dang, right? You know, Bible, messing it up as usual, right? You know. So, so yeah, I'll leave that up to your individual marriages on how you're going to navigate this. But the point is, the point is, husbands go first and you lay down your life for your wife. And yeah, that doesn't mean that the wives now become this overlord over the husbands. Remember, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Love is this idea. Marriage is this idea where you have two cups that are constantly pouring into one another. And the Bible doesn't say husbands love your wives, wives love your husbands. It says lives, excuse me, husbands love your wives, wives respect your husbands. Because what's really interesting is if my wife brought me a big bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day, I'm like, oh honey, thank you, you shouldn't have. Really, you shouldn't have because I'm not really into flowers or whatever. But she came and she said, I want you to know that what you did when you re replaced the windshield wipers on the van, that just means so much to me. And I'm like, really? You noticed that? That's awesome. See, this is the way bra the brain of the man is wired differently than the brain of the woman. I don't know if you guys knew that, right? It's, it's, it's true. This is one of the flaws of our society when we try to say that men and women are not distinct. They are very much of the same value in the eyes of God. No question about that. But they are different. And anyone who says that they're not is just absolutely, I don't know what to say to that. It's just bonkers, right? And so when we talk about husbands loving your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that's where we begin. Now guys, here's the, here's the important thing. Is this law or is this gospel? And it's so important to ask this question. Because we define law as something where you and I are the subject of the sentence. We're the action. We're the person who's doing the work. And, and, and if you're like me and you're a husband and you're sitting there like, I, I try to do this, but you just ask my wife. It doesn't happen that way all the time, right? And so that's why we need the gospel. The gospel is when God works, right? It's when he does stuff. It's when he is the one who is the action. And then he is the one who comes in to help us when we fail to do this. So this is not some sort of like, well, you know, you better get it right. And because and, and, see, a lot of us might be sitting here going, yeah, well, my husband never did that, and that's why we're divorced now. Or my girlfriend, she never would do anything when I said that when I was trying to do this, she never responded to me, and so now we're not even together anymore. And so, yeah, this is how it's designed, but it isn't always how it plays out. Take a look at Ephesians 5, 26 to 27. Because if you remember what the Apostle Paul says at the end, he's talking about husbands, wives, husbands, wives. I'm talking about Jesus in the church, but also husbands, wives. This is the thing that's going on. If you're single, if you're married, if you're divorced, if you're happily married, or if your marriage is just like, oh my goodness, why did he have to preach on that today? Or anywhere in between, if you are hurting and lonely, some of you guys can be fully married and be very lonely. Some of you guys can be completely disenfranchised from all the people in your life and your relationships have been a mess and you feel lonely. And when you think about the way that it's all happened, you feel shame because you feel like I should have done, I could have done, I, I wish it would have worked out, I wish that I would never have done this or that they would never have done that. I want you to read this passage of Scripture. I want you to receive this Word of God to you because this is where He promises you. Jesus did all of this to make her, that's you guys, all of you guys, holy. Holy means different. It means set apart, distinct, utterly different. Cleansing her, His bride, that's you guys, the church, with the washing of the water through the Word. You know, the Apostle Paul is very annoying. He just keeps bringing baptism in, up on, into all these things no matter what happens. He just keeps doing it. And so he says, when you were washed, you were cleansed. It's, a, it's, it's an objective moment that happened to you. You can look back in time and say, look, I don't know, any, know anything about baptism, but the Bible says that when I was baptized, I was washed clean. And every time you get in the shower in the morning and you turn it on and the water hits you and you're like, oh, thank God because I, I needed the shower to wake up or whatever. Let the water hit you and be reminded of the time the water hit you. And you were washed clean. There is no shame for you. 
You are washed through the water. How did it happen? Through the Word. It was His promises. It's not just water. It's not holy water. It's not fancy water. It's not like sparkling water. Maybe it was. I don't know. The point is, is it was His Word. It was His promises that made this true. And to present her to Himself. To present you to Himself as a radiant church. That word is just the word radiant. It just, it just keeps going. It's beautiful and adorning. And this like his most prized, precious possession. Exodus chapter 19. This is who you guys are. You are his people. You are his bride. Whether you're single or married or divorced or broken or damaged goods, as some people will call people. It's like you are not those things. You are a radiant church. You are without stain. You are without wrinkle or any other blemish you are holy and you are blameless receive his words into your heart this is the truth of the ancient of days given to you by the bridegroom happy valentine's day right because that's that's what it should have been about not about would you be mine but that he came to earth and said would you be mine so that way no matter where you're at in the spectrum of relationships no matter where you're at, you need to know that you're holy and that you're blameless because that gives you the ability to get out of bed one more time and to face whatever the situation you have to face, which is, oh my gosh, here she comes. She's going to be mad at me again. Oh my gosh, there he is. He's going to fail to do it again. He's going gonna, gonna to be clueless once again. Guess what? That's what happens to men. And so, and then, and then you might, or you might be saying, today's another day of just me being lonely or hurting or broken. Or you might be a day when you're like, he talked about all those situations, but the Lord has given me a beloved. And we've got something special. Know that all of that is from Jesus. And that wherever you're at today, he is preparing for you, preparing you for what comes tomorrow. And I don't know what comes for tomorrow for you. I can't say. He doesn't say. He just says to trust him, to believe him. And as you do so, to know that you are blameless. Every time the evil one comes to you and causes you to feel shame, say, well, actually, I'm betrothed. I'm engaged to Jesus. I know that's weird for us guys. We're like, I'm not going to say that. But you know what I'm saying, right? I am <laughs> I'm purchased by the bridegroom. He took care of everything for me. I think what we should do right now is pray about that and ask Him to make that true all the more and for us to be able to believe that on the days when we struggle and face those other things that pull us down. Please pray with me. Father, we ask You right now to heal our hearts. No matter where we're at in our relationships, we have experienced brokenness. And I pray right now that You would restore us. You have promised peace. And we pray right now for your perfect peace. Not just the absence of conflict, although for some of our relationships that's there. But restoration. To bless that which was broken. Yeah, maybe we blew it and we had one divorce, two divorces, three divorces, however many. We're not damaged goods in your eyes. Remind us of that. We are restored and set free to participate with you in the kingdom. And that's going to be different for each one of us. Help us trust in that and not to measure our quote-unquote success or failure based upon what other people have or don't. But help us focus on what you have in store for us as individuals so that we would remember that your plan all along is that they would become one. And however that plays out in our lives, to put our trust in you. So we ask for your peace we ask for your grace to take away the shame. And we ask for you to live in us and through us. Reminding us that we are precious and blameless in your sight. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.